So today we're going to go for essentially a romp through the universe. We're going to follow the journey of oxygen from the, its birth in the first stars right through to the oxygen that you're breathing right now, sitting in this beautiful theatre. So this is work that I've been doing over the past few years and it involves a number of PhD students here at Hawaii and also it makes the use of the Keck tel telescope in particular. So we're going to start the journey of oxygen in the very, very early days in the universe at the Big Bang. And then we're going to follow the birth of oxygen right inside the centres of the first stars in the universe. And we're going to move through oxygen's journey being blown out of stars into supernova and then blown out of stars also in massive stellar winds. Finally, oxygen ends up in planets which are forming around the young hot stars and ends up in the early atmospheres of planets like Earth. And then finally I'll talk about oxygen that you're breathing right now. So first, just a little bit about oxygen you might not know. You're of course breathing oxygen right now, and you actually breathe about 0.05 to 0.1 ounces of oxygen per minute. So if you do a, a quick math calculation and work out how much that is in a year, then you're actually inhaling about a tonne of oxygen in a year. So, what's a ton? It's about the weight of a rhinoceros, or maybe a small elephant. Okay, so, so why do we need this much oxygen? This is actually a very large amount of oxygen that we're all breathing. It needs to be a large amount of oxygen on Earth for all of us to survive. So, what we use oxygen for is to make energy. So, here, this equation here, this is glucose, this is what you get from food. And we need oxygen with that, and then we breathe out carbon dioxide, we make water, and we also make energy. And our brain is what uses most of that energy. You might think that when you run marathons, you're using a lot of energy. Our brain uses vastly more energy than that. And this energy comes from, from oxygen and also the food we eat. And so the oxygen here that I'm talking about is the molecular oxygen. So you have two oxygen atoms, you join them together. So here, you've got one oxygen and another oxygen. In the universe, they're not created this way. They're actually created as single atoms. So we're going to start off with oxygen's creation as single atoms. So oxygen looks like this. It has neutrons and protons in the center, and then surrounding it, it has eight electrons. And so we're going to start now with the Big Bang. The Big Bang happened 12 to 14 billion years ago. And the universe was actually only a few millimetres in size. So about the size of my little finger. And that's what the size of the universe was. But then it expanded at a huge rate. And so it wasn't really like an explosion. A lot of people think of the Big Bang as an explosion. But if you think of an explosion, an explosion blows things out of where the centre of the explosion was. And you, you'll be able to find debris in a circle around the explosion, but really nothing in the middle. That's not what expansion is. Expansion is that everything everywhere is moving apart from each other. There's no center, there's no center of the universe, and there's no edge. And so what's happening is that these individual galaxies here, the space between them is moving apart. The space between all galaxies everywhere in the universe continues to move apart. And so you can imagine the Big Bang as the simultaneous appearance everywhere, suddenly, of space. Okay, so where, where did oxygen start being created? We had a Big Bang, suddenly space is moving apart. Then oxygen was created after the early days of the universe. In the very early days of the universe, it was actually very, very dark. And hydrogen and helium atoms formed. And they actually made puddles of gas. But the puddles didn't look like this. These puddles here, you can actually see they're illuminated. The puddles of gas were dark. They didn't emit light. They absorbed light. So we call those the dark ages of the universe. And now, after the dark ages, we had the first stars. So this is the gas, and gas clumped together, and essentially is attracting itself by gravity. And you can see all these clumps of gas coming together. We're going to zoom in now and the yellow parts are the densest parts. And you might, if you look carefully, see little white spots here. These are the stars just being born. 
you can see a star's just been shot out here. Some stars are being shot out here. And I wish I had sound effects like golf balls going off because now there's a huge amount of stars being, being born here in this dense gas cloud. And the reason why they're coming out so fast is because the gas is, is hitting each other like, like waves, like ocean waves. And they're hitting each other so fast that the energy is being given to some of these stars and makes them come off at, at high speeds. And now we have a, a central cluster of stars which has just been born in these dense gas clouds. And eventually we're going to zoom out. Here we go. And now we can look around and see what this cluster actually looks like in 3D. So you can see the dust and the gas which is still around the cluster and the star cluster in the centre. So this took about 200,000 years for this type of star cluster to be born. And so in these first stars is where oxygen was first created in the universe. And from the first stars, we have, we make the first galaxies, slowly, slowly over the ages of the universe. So we have the new simulation called the Millennium Simulation, which is one of the best simulations that astronomers have made so far to simulate how galaxies like the Milky Way evolved through from the very early days of the universe right to galaxies that we see today. And this is an example of what we call a merger tree. It looks a bit like a tree. And what it's telling you is where galaxies or small clumps of gas were in the past and then where they ended up colliding to form bigger clumps or bigger galaxies. So the, the red parts here are old. This, this was, a, was a small clump of gas and this was a small clump of gas and eventually they moved together and collided with some other clumps and they moved together with these ones and collided and this is starting to form a galaxy here. So we have small gas clumps colliding together with larger gas clumps colliding and those large gas clumps collided together to form small galaxies and small galaxies collided together to form big galaxies like the galaxies that we see around us today. I'm going to show you a simulation of this happening. This is the Millennium Simulation. These are the, the best simulations we have today of galaxies forming. Now this is the early, early days of the universe. Galaxies hadn't formed yet. And if you look carefully, it's changing. The blue spots are space, and the white parts are where galaxies are forming. And what's happening is gas is, is clumping together and forming small galaxies, and then those are clumping together to form larger galaxies. And we're getting close to the present day right now. We're going down, down in, or actually going up in age. And now this is what we have in the present day universe. And so we have a lot more space. And then most of the matter in the universe is in galaxies. Okay, so we had the first galaxies were, had a lot of star formation happening in them, and in those stars, that's where oxygen was created. And so the idea behind this research is to try to understand how the oxygen rose from past levels, from the, its birth in the first stars, to the present day amount of oxygen that we have, which allows life to form. Okay, so if we look at where the Big Bang happened compared to where first oxygen was formed, if we consider this diagram, this is we're looking at the Big Bang over here, and then here is the modern day universe. So time goes in this direction, like that. And so we had the Dark Ages, remember that was where we just had hydrogen and helium puddles. And then the first stars, they lit up the universe, and suddenly the universe was bright, and they were formed in small gas clumps. They clumped together to form bigger gas clumps, which clumped together to form small galaxies, which clumped together to form large galaxies. So the first galaxies were formed about here, very close to the Big Bang, about 0.4 to 0.7 times the, the age of the universe. And now, this is about how far we can see with the Hubble Space Telescope. So we can go back to very early days of the universe, less than a tenth of the age of the universe. And with Keck Telescope, we can actually look back about here. And I'm going to show you a new technique that we've been using to look back almost as much as the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. And so now oxygen is formed inside stars. So we're going to have a look at how oxygen is formed inside stars. You look at this simulation. This is what it might look like inside a star. It's actually mostly empty space. And then the atoms are whizzing around pretty fast. And every now and then you'll see a bang. 
where they'll hit each other and fuse together. So these are protons and neutrons. There we go, we just had one. So the actual speed is hundreds of miles a second. You couldn't, we couldn't see that with our eye on this simulation. So this is vastly slowed down compared to how fast these um, protons and neutrons are moving inside stars. And the temperature is millions of degrees. So it's this massive furnace, a huge amount of energy in there, which allows these, these protons and neutrons to move so fast that, that sometimes, even though there's a lot of space, sometimes they hit each other and fuse together. So there are a couple of different ways that oxygen is created inside stars, and this is one of them. This is called the triple alpha process. What happens is we get some helium, helium together, and they fuse together to form beryllium. Beryllium, if you add another helium to it, fuses together to form carbon. Carbon actually radio radioactively decays into an oxygen if you give it another helium. So we get some gamma rays released, and now we have an oxygen inside stars. And there's another way, in the most massive stars, they also produce oxygen this way, and this is a cycle, sort of like a, a life cycle of carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen inside stars. It starts here, you need carbon, you add a hydrogen, bang, you get nitrogen. Nitrogen decays into carbon, add a hydrogen, bang, you get a different type of nitrogen, and another hydrogen, bang, you get oxygen. Okay, and then oxygen actually can decay into a different type of nitrogen, and the circle goes on and on and on. So this is another way of getting oxygen in stars. It's called the carbon-nitrogen-oxygen cycle. So if oxygen is created inside stars, how does it actually get out of stars to form, to form into planets and then into planetary atmospheres so that we can breathe it? So oxygen can be thrown out of stars in a couple of different ways. One way is in oxygen-rich supernova. So supernova are when you get a massive star and it runs out of energy. So a massive star is only held up by the energy of the fusion reactions happening in its core. And the fusion can be hydrogen, helium, uh, lithium, boron, and so on down the chain until iron. And it gets to iron. Iron actually requires more energy to fuse it than it's going to release. So it, it stops there. And when it stops, the gravity of these massive stars is so immense that the star will collapse on itself. And it starts collapsing, and it's essentially it's like a rebound effect. It blows away the outer layers. It bounces back out. And so a lot of the outer layers of the star blow off into space in a massive supernova. The core continues contracting because it's not held up by any energy anymore. And this core continues contracting into what we call a neutron star. It's held up by neutrons. It's extremely, extremely dense, much denser than the sun, for example. And so the mass, it's about one and a half times the sun, but it's only 12 miles in diameter. Okay, so imagine taking the sun and putting it into 12 miles. And that's, it's denser than that inside a neutron star. So the neutron star is what left over from these massive star supernova, but the supernova is what's blown out the oxygen. So here's an image here of a Chandra X-ray image of an oxygen-rich supernova. So this is the supernova. This is the material that's been blown out of a star. And it has large amounts of oxygen, as well as other atoms like neon, magnesium, silicon, and sulfur. There's actually three oxygen-rich supernova known in our galaxy, but other supernova can throw out smaller amounts of oxygen as well. There's another way of throwing out uh, oxygen from stars, but first, here's another example of an oxygen-rich supernova, and the blue here is the oxygen. So all of this oxygen was thrown out from a supernova when the star exploded. It actually exploded 3,000 light years ago. The speeds that it's blown out at is about 4 million miles an hour. It's really hard to get your brain around how fast that is. Another way of getting oxygen out of stars is through stellar winds. So massive stars can be very unstable. They can be pulsating. The outer regions of the stars can be going in and out, in and out, in and out. Because the energy from the fusion reactions in the very massive stars at the latest stages of its lifetime is very unstable. They can suddenly have big amounts of energy 
in a small amount and then a large amount of energy release so that the layers are going like this and sometimes the other layers just blow off and then they'll blow off again and again and again. And so in these stellar winds, the winds can reach speeds of 200 kilometers per second or about 45,000 miles an hour. And so these winds are blowing off material into the medium surrounding the stars. Another way of getting uh, oxygen out of stars is through a planetary nebula. In a planetary nebula, the layers are being blown off of a star. It's a star like our sun. So when our sun runs out of energy from fusion reactions, nothing left to fuse in the core, the sun is going to blow off its outer layers into a planetary nebula. Here's an example of a planetary nebula. This is a Hubble Space Telescope image. And these form supersonic shock waves, massive wave crests. They're just like the waves in the ocean, except they're carrying really dense gas out into space. And these supersonic wave crests are about 100 billion miles high. So, you surfers out there, eat your heart out. <laughs> okay, so we know that oxygen's blown out of stars. It's sitting around outside stars now. How can we observe it? How do we know that how much oxygen there was in the universe? And why did it reach the levels that it did today? Why are we breathing it now? Well, first, how do we observe oxygen? Well, we use spectroscopy. And spectroscopy is essentially you take white light, and our white light comes from galaxies that we observe with telescopes like Keck, and we split the light off into individual colors. And so you get a spectrum like this. And in our spectrum, what we're looking at is we're looking at hot gas. We're looking at the hot gas surrounding young hot stars. So the young hot stars inside galaxies are heating up the gas around them. They're illuminating the gas around them. And those gas, gas clouds actually emit lines like this. And these lines can be produced by different atoms. So you may get some lines from oxygen, some from hydrogen, some from nitrogen. And so we can tell a lot about galaxies by looking at these lines that are emitted by the atoms that are in a hot gas inside galaxies. And this is how we measure the amount of oxygen. And so this is a real spectrum that we have observed in a nearby galaxy. And it's color-coded according to where the lines are in the spectrum. And so this is oxygen. And here's another oxygen line. This is a hydrogen line hydrogen, and we've got some sulfur here in another oxygen line, also some small lines like helium. So we can learn a lot about the atoms inside galaxies and how much they are by looking at these lines from a spectrum, by just splitting the light up into the different colors. And so now what we can do by splitting the light up into the colors and looking at spectra for, and the lines from oxygen, we can look at hundreds and thousands of galaxies it's a great time to be doing astronomy and looking at the amount of oxygen because we have a massive data set to use for nearby galaxies and we've got great tools to look at the faintest and most distant galaxies in the universe. For nearby galaxies, we use a survey called the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. Sloan digitally, digitally surveyed about 60% of the nearby sky. And so this is an image, essentially we're looking at a pie. If you look up at the sky in a pie shape, and look out as far as you can with a small telescope, then you would get an image sort of looking like this. And you can see these are galaxy clusters clustering together. Each of these little points are galaxies. And so we have hundreds of thousands of galaxies where we have a spectrum for every single galaxy. So we can measure the amount of oxygen in the nearby universe for hundreds of thousands of galaxies. So we can characterize really well how much oxygen there is in the nearby universe using this survey. Now, what we want to do is we want to look back in time. We want to measure the amount of oxygen in galaxies in the very distant universe, where the light that we see from them today takes billions and billions of years to get to us. So we can look back more than 10 billion years. We can look back to galaxies that are so distant that the light that was emitted took 10 billion years to get to us, and we're seeing it right now. So we are looking back in time. Astronomy is the only science where we can look back in time. And so what we want to do is we want to combine our observations of oxygen in these faint, distant galaxies with the amount of oxygen that we know is 
in nearby galaxies like this beautiful whirlpool spiral galaxy or our own Milky Way. And so to do that, we essentially we try to measure the amount of oxygen in many galaxies, an ensemble of galaxies. And you can imagine that as like a cube. All of these are galaxies. We've got a space dimension, space dimension. Okay, we're just looking out at the universe. And then the other dimension is time. Okay, so we have a cube where one, one of the dimensions of the cube is time. And this is how we, we think of measuring the amount of oxygen in the universe. And so to look at distant galaxies, we do a couple of different techniques. One, we use the Hubble Deep Field. So this is a deep field that the Hubble Space Telescope looked at, and it looked at and looked at and looked at and stared at this field for a really long time. And so what we have is we have images of galaxies that are very, 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 very faint. And they can go back to about the 10th tenth of the time of the age of the universe. And now, we can also look at galaxies even fainter. So we can look at nature's faintest galaxies by using a really clever technique. This technique is called gravitational lensing. What we do is essentially like having a magnifying glass, where the magnifying glass is the size of a huge cluster of galaxies. It's like having a telescope the size of a cluster of galaxies probably wondering how we do that. And so there's a really nifty thing in astronomy where if you have an object like this circle here and light behind the object, the object is so massive that its gravity can bend light. And so light from a distant galaxy can get bent around the massive object and we observe it over here. And if light is bent around the massive object, it's light creating a refracting telescope or a magnifying glass. And so what's happening is the light from the distant galaxy, it gets magnified and it also gets stretched. So we can see galaxies in great detail in the distant universe as long as we've got something really massive in front of it to bend the light around it. And the bending actually creates very interesting images, which I'll show you more a little bit later on. Now the most massive things in the universe that do gravitational lensing, that bend the light around them, are galaxy clusters. So massive clusters of galaxies. You could have hundreds and thousands or hundreds of thousands of galaxies in these clusters. You imagine the amount of mass that's in these type of clusters. There, those massive clusters are bending the light of the background galaxies around them. And so just to show you what gravitational lensing does to an image, this is the Smithsonian Natural History Museum. Some of you might have been to this museum. I'm going to put a gravitational lensing mass in front of it. And this is a mathematically correct model of lensing the Smithsonian Natural History Museum. Okay, so we're about to put a lensing mass in front of it. Whoa. <laughs> so what's happened here is it's been distorted and it's been amplified. So you can see that the, the, it's much bigger in some parts but also it's been distorted. And so the tower of the Natural History Museum goes up like this, but there's also a mirror image upside down over here. This is the same tower as here. And this tower, of course, comes down here, and this bit here is actually part of the ground. Okay, so this is what nearby galaxy clusters do to the light from background galaxies. It distorts them, and bends them, but it actually amplifies the light as well. So if we can get back the image of a galaxy, so we can go, if we could go from this back to that, then what we can do is we can actually reproduce what a galaxy in the distant universe would look like um, before the gravitational lensing, and then we learn about the distant universe that we would have no hope of learning without this technique these galaxies are so distant you cannot see them unless they were lensed. <coughs> okay, so lensing distorts images and these are the sorts of things that it does to galaxies. So this would have been a nice spiral type galaxy, we think. And this is, it's been distorted into what looks like a Cheshire cat here. This one's called the bullseye. And these, these little points here are little star-forming regions in the background galaxy. This one's called the Einstein cross. Multiple, these are multiple images of the same thing. And here we have a cosmic horseshoe. Astronomers really love making up these types of terms for <laughs> gravitational lenses. This is a cosmic eyelash. We actually just 
observe the cosmic eyelash um, with Keck. And here's a cosmic eye. You need an eye as well as an eyelash. And there's many, many, many more examples of this. So what we have now, we have the situation where we have the lights being bent from the background galaxies and distorted. We're at the point with modern comp computation that we can actually create a great model of the lensing cluster. If we go and observe the lensing cluster, we put slits on all of the galaxies in the lensing cluster, we know where they all are and how big they are, and we can estimate the effect from the lensing. And so we can actually reproduce what the galaxies would look like without the lensing, and we can test ourselves because we can predict where multiple images would have appeared. Remember the Smithsonian History Museum, there were two images of its towers. So these models can predict where another image is. If we go and find that other image and it's there, our model is probably pretty much spot on. So what we've been doing is we've been looking at nearby galaxy clusters that have very, very good lensing models, very good models which allow us to reconstruct the galaxy behind the lensing cluster. There's many, many, many galaxies sitting behind the lensing cluster that are distorted and, and magnified so that we can observe them. And this one here shows a lensing cluster and the big, big ones here, big galaxies, these are in the cluster. And you can tell the lenses because they're kind of distorted and stretched. They're elongated like this. And they tend to have a centre, which is the centre of the mass, the most mass of the cluster. It has a centre probably about here, because you can see that there are a lot of curves which seem to be centred on here. So what we do, we take these lensing clusters, we take our lensing models, and then we go to the Keck and Subaru telescopes. And we observe the distant background galaxies to see if we can measure the amount of oxygen. And so here is a spectrum. This is... It may look really messy to you, it may look like a bunch of wiggles, but to a, an astronomer, this is beautiful. Really incredibly beautiful. So this is a very faint lensed galaxy. This, this lensed galaxy is about almost 10 billion years back. So we're looking back about 10 billion years. And you can see oxygen, you can see hydrogen, another oxygen line, and another hydrogen line here. So this is a very, very beautiful spectrum and allows us to measure the amount of oxygen looking back about 10 billion years. And another thing we can do, if the galaxies are at the right angle to us, we can actually image them. And Keck has a very, very clever instrument called OSIRIS. And OSIRIS, what it does is it takes images as well as spectra. And so for, for every pixel here, across here, you can get a spectrum. This allows us to measure how the amount of oxygen changes within galaxies. And we can see how the oxygen built up within galaxies over time. It essentially provides us with a two-dimensional picture of oxygen in galaxies over time. So here's an example. This is one that we observe with Keck Osiris. And this galaxy is very far back in the universe. This is about, uh, and again, about 10 billion years, 11 billion years in the past. This is what it would have looked like without the gravitational lensing, without being behind a nearby cluster that's bending and amplifying its light. It would be that big. We wouldn't have any hope of trying to get the amount of oxygen and how the oxygen is spread throughout the galaxy. Because it's been stretched five times on a side and then it's been magnified 30 times by the nearby galaxy cluster, it allows us to see these spiral arms. So this is spiral arms in a galaxy 10 billion years back in the past. Galaxies had spiral arms back then, some of them. And so this allows us to measure the amount of oxygen not only in the centre, but also in the outer regions of the galaxy. And we can compare that to where the oxygen is in the Milky Way and other nearby galaxies. And so this is the only plot I'm going to show you. This is the only astronomy plot. This shows you the amount of oxygen and as a function of radius. So we're moving out in, in the galaxy from the centre to the outer regions. And this is our spiral galaxy that we measured. And this is local galaxies, nearby galaxies in our Milky Way look like this. So you can see that this galaxy here, 10 billion years ago, was much steeper. It has a much steeper oxygen, we would call it a slope or a gradient. So the amount of oxygen in this galaxy in the central regions was much higher 
and the amount of oxygen in the outer parts of the galaxy than in nearby galaxies. So you can think the amount of oxygen is high compared to the outer regions, and in nearby galaxies it's much more like that. So the oxygen is more spread out. What this tells us is that galaxies were built inside out, that the amount of oxygen in galaxies built up in the central regions and then slowly came and accreted with time to build up the oxygen in the outer regions. This is important because we are not in the central part of our galaxy. We are in the spiral arms. Now, if we can look at the, how the oxygen changed with time now, so here this is the plot I showed you before where we have the Big Bang, the Dark Ages. First oxygen was created in the first stars. We know from looking at the amount of oxygen in galaxies with time, I just showed you a couple of galaxies, but we have hundreds of galaxies. In fact, we have thousands of galaxies out to about here, and then we have um, a few galaxies out at this part here, where we've measured the amount of oxygen. And so what we know is that the oxygen rose, the levels rose by millions in the very early days of the universe, okay, in the first one billion years. And then it's actually only been rising very slowly over the past, say, 10 billion years, 7 billion years. And so oxygen levels rose quickly and then it kind of tailed off with time based on our observations of the amount of oxygen we was taking. And so what this tells us is that essentially oxygen, it was created in stars. It tells us that most of the stars were forming and blowing out oxygen in the very early days of the universe. And there's not so much happening these days. And it also tells us that oxygen first built up in the centers of the galaxies, and then oxygen over time built up in the outer regions. And we're, we're situated in a spiral arm of the Milky Way out here. So the fact that we are here now today breathing oxygen, we had to have been later on in the age of the universe. We had to, as humans we, that need oxygen, we would have to be later on in the age of the universe for the amount of oxygen levels to, to be enough that we would have planets created and planets created with oxygen. Okay, so we know how oxygen was created in, in stars, thrown out, we know how we can measure it, but then how does it get into the planets? around stars, because it's formed in stars and then thrown out of stars. But that doesn't then therefore get into planets necessarily. So planets are formed in disks around stars, young stars. So these are images, these are uh, images from the Space Telescope, Hubble Space Telescope, of real disks around very, very young stars. These stars are newly formed. So the black parts here are the disks around the young stars. And what we think happened is that in the very early days of the solar system, the star, the sun formed, and around it was basically dust and gas left over. And that dust and gas collapsed to form a disk. And then within that disk, pieces joined together just through gravity, joined together, joined together, joined together, and essentially started clearing out paths in the disk, like these holes in the disk. And each of these paths is where a, a planet is forming. And starting, to, it's like a snowball. So you push a snowball, and it will collect snow, collect snow, connect, collect snow until it's quite big. It's the same here with a planet moving about in the, the disk around a young, hot, newly formed star. Okay, so 4.5 billion years ago, Earth began to form in this disk around the Sun. So we can imagine this is the Earth here forming in this disk. The disk is made up of, of gas and dust. And so the disk essentially is basically just leftovers from the sun's formation. Now I have a three-year-old, and so this, <laughs> this really appealed to me here. And so it's just leftovers. So we just have oxygen, and it's sitting inside the Earth, leftover from the sun's formation. But it's locked in the Earth's crust in the early days. It wasn't actually in an atmosphere, and Earth didn't have an atmosphere right at the very beginning. And so why did oxygen start appearing in Earth's atmosphere? Some planets don't have atmospheres, some planets don't have oxygen in their atmospheres. Why, why Earth? And so 2.5 to 1.6 billion years ago, this is a very short time compared to the age of the universe, oxygen molecules started appearing in Earth. They were being created. And what we think was creating those oxygen is these little tiny little round things called cyanobacteria. And you can go and get these in the ocean if you want to. 
So these are still out there, cyanobacteria, and these are the ones that first started creating oxygen molecules on Earth. They're really tiny, they're about a centimetre, about the size of your, your pinky finger again. And we know that because of fossil records. And so we can look at fossil records, old rocks, called stromatolites, and inside these stromatolites are fossil traces of these cyanobacteria, and there's oxygen. So we know the oxygen started appearing about 2.5 to 1.6 billion years ago. Okay, so oxygen was produced by photosynthesis, and this is again what, what plants do. So they took sunlight and water, carbon dioxide and nutrients, and these are nutrients from the ocean back in the, the old days, the early days of the universe, and they created an organic matter and oxygen. And so, but the problem is that actually the early atmosphere of the Earth initially was methane, so it would have been really, really smelly. But methane reacted with oxygen, and methane was keeping the Earth very, very warm. When oxygen started reacting with methane, it cooled down the atmosphere of the Earth, and the reaction is the same as what happens when you light your gas stove. You have methane and oxygen produce carbon dioxide, So that actually caused the first ice age when the oxygen was produced. It produced, it actually dropped the temperature so much that almost all of the bacteria died out. And most of the cyanobacteria died. And so actually life almost got wiped out because of the sheer amount of oxygen that they suddenly produced, reacted with methane, dropped the temperature. We're actually really lucky that just a few of them survived. And so what happened was, you can see this plot here shows you the amount of oxygen, and then 300 million years ago, oxygen levels rose again. And so, so what was happening? Why did it suddenly rise again? Well, you had enough, you had enough species, you had enough species of bacteria that what happened was they mutated, and instead of just surviving and producing oxygen, they actually were able to take in oxygen from the atmosphere. So they absorbed some oxygen. They started to work with what the new atmosphere was. Instead of just being methane, the new atmosphere had oxygen, a lot of oxygen in it. So they started taking oxygen and producing carbon dioxide. And so this is very clever. And so oxygen levels, they started creating a lot of oxygen. They're about 35%. And so from the fossil records, we know that at those days, because there was so much oxygen, it actually allowed insects to get really, really big. This is a real image of a fossil record of a dragonfly, where its wings were three feet long. And I might be exaggerating, because Australians have a tendency to exaggerate, but I did read somewhere that centipedes were about 10 meters long. So I'm pretty glad that, that uh, these didn't hang around till today. Okay, so to summarize, the journey of oxygen, we started off with the Big Bang, and the Big Bang suddenly space expanding everywhere. First stars. The first stars formed from clumps of gas, which were hydrogen helium puddles, clumping together, clumping together, and getting very, very dense. And the denser they are, the more stars they form. So the first stars then form, and then, were able, the stars blew out oxygen in the supernova. And nowadays we have big, massive big galaxies with a huge amount of stars being formed and a huge amount of supernova blowing out oxygen. Also stellar winds from massive stars which are doing pulsations, pulsating, they blow off outer layers intermittently. That allows the amount of oxygen to build up in the surrounding material. And then we can measure that oxygen by using clever techniques. We combine Keck and we also use gravitational lensing where nearby galaxy clusters bend and magnify the light. And essentially we're simulating a telescope which is as big as, as a cluster of galaxies that contains about 100,000 galaxies. And so that allowed us to figure out that the amount of oxygen rose quickly with time and now is rising very slowly. So in the early days of the universe, the amount of oxygen rose quickly. There was a lot of stars producing a lot of oxygen back then. Nowadays, it's just kind of petering along a little bit of oxygen, uh, increasing with time. But those, that oxygen ended up in future episodes of stars being formed. 
So the oxygen was sitting around from previous generations of stars which had blown out the oxygen in supernova and stellar winds. And then that material was the birth point for new stars and then contained oxygen inside it. And so the planets which then formed from the leftovers of the star, new star's formation contained oxygen in them. The oxygen then ended up in the early atmosphere thanks to cyanobacteria, almost wiped itself out, but didn't quite. And so then we get to the oxygen that you're breathing right now. The oxygen that you're breathing right now, take a deep breath everybody. Okay, the oxygen that you just breathe is about 11 to 13 billion years old. Okay, it was created in stars, it had a great history, it escaped from the stars in massive supernova explosions and stellar winds, and that oxygen almost didn't make it. it. The oxygen catastrophe almost wiped out life on Earth. But actually, it's really good to be alive. We're very lucky that that didn't happen. That's the end.